Hello, and welcome back to the Urology Care Podcast, the official podcast of the Urology Care Foundation. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and we have two guests with us to talk about prostate cancer and how early detection can help high-risk patients. Our first guest is Dr. Brian McNeil, a urologic oncologist in Brooklyn, New York at the SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. Our second guest is Dr. Paul Moroni, a urologic oncologist in Aurora, Colorado at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. We have a great discussion ahead and we hope you enjoy. Well, Dr. McNeil and Dr. Moroni, welcome and thank you both for joining us on today's podcast. Can you both briefly introduce yourselves to our listeners? Well, hello, listeners. My name is Paul Maroney. I'm a urologic oncologist at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and the program leader for the Urologic Oncology Clinic. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Brian McNeil. I'm a urologic oncologist as well. I work in Brooklyn at the SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. Thank you. We're happy to have you both here on the podcast today. So Dr. McNeil, I'd like to start with you as I know that you have a pretty full circle story in terms of your experiences growing up and where you are now. Could you share a little bit about your background growing up in Philadelphia and how you came to learn about prostate cancer within your family? Sure, sure, absolutely, happy to do that. Um, As you mentioned, uh, a proud Philadelphia native, uh, 76ers forever, I bleed eagle green. I hope that that doesn't offend anyone out there in the podcast universe, but I just had to admit that first off. The story of prostate cancer is one that is very personal to me and that I lost my father to prostate cancer and I lost him at a pretty young age. Uh, my father died when I was 15 years old and I viewed him as a hero, a strong guy, a charismatic guy. And I saw him uh, be diagnosed with prostate cancer and die within a couple of years. Um, So the fact that I went on to become a urologist and a urologic oncologist at that is pretty interesting. And as I fight to make an impact in communities, I think that I also fight out of fear because I think that the breakthroughs that we make as a field may help to save my own life one day. It keeps me up at night at times, honestly. After the experiences with your father, where did you go from there in terms of getting into the medical field and then ultimately deciding to become a urologist? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, losing my father at such a young age, I decided to seek out more male role models. And I was fortunate enough to uh, attend Morehouse College in Atlanta where I was exposed to a number of uh, great role models who really inspired me to be something uh, greater than myself in a way. And uh, they really um, inspired the mission of servant leadership. Uh, What led me to medicine was actually a dream. When I was a freshman at Morehouse, I had this same dream every couple of weeks. And I had a dream that I was in the laboratory working to re-engineer the human immune system to attack various diseases. And I thought, hey, this must be a sign that I'm supposed to be a physician. And I decided to, you know, pursue the pre-med path and go to medical school. And what led me to urology was a surgical subspecialties rotation when I was a third year medical student. Um, I really enjoyed the urology, working with the urologist that I met. I felt like I was part of a big team. And with every patient encounter, I thought about my father. I thought about my family. And I tried to deliver the care that I wish my father would have had when I was a younger male. That's incredible. Thank you. So now in your, in your work now, um, I mean, I know you do a lot of work, obviously, with men who have prostate cancer, but also with those who are in underserved medical communities. What does that mean for you now, um, having the experiences that you did growing up? Yeah, it means a great deal. It, uh, it really drives me every day. There's this guy, Simon Sinek, and he has this theory about uh, what he calls the golden circle. And he states that the why is important in all of us. You know, great organizations, uh, great leaders, their why is incredibly important. And my why is to sort of help make things better for those coming after me. 
and to serve, you know, medically underserved populations similar to the one in which I grew up in. So I serve a community like that in Brooklyn. And thank goodness for organizations like the American Urological Association, which has exposed me to communities abroad that are similar. Uh, with the AUA, I've done some things in uh, Brazil, uh, actually spending time working in favelas with some of our urology colleagues there. So it's my mission, it's my why, and it's what drives me every day. Great. Thank you so much for being so open and sharing your story with us. Dr. Moroni, I wanted to turn it over to you. If you could touch a little bit on your work in the field of prostate cancer. Right. So Thanks, Dr. McNeil, for sharing that story. I think that's really powerful. And as physician leaders, we try to really show um, how we're working, working hard for our patients. As far as my work in prostate cancer, here at the University of Colorado, uh, as a, a leader in my urologic oncology clinic, I primarily focus on treating men with prostate cancer and really direct how we, our early detection efforts, the work that we do in terms of getting men into the right places in our multidisciplinary clinic, making sure that they're fully educated about all their options for treatment. We try hard to uh, ensure that patients are getting equal care throughout our clinic. And as far as uh, our work in uh, prostate cancer or, or the work that I do with prostate cancer patients. We have a, a long tradition here at the University of Colorado uh, that was really started by Dr. Crawford over 20 years ago when prostate cancer screening was really in its infancy. You know, PSA came around. We didn't really know how to, to work with this. Uh, we knew that, that it could indicate that men have prostate cancer. However, we didn't know exactly the best way to use it. So we were part of the original PLCO trials. Uh, Dr. Crawford, one of my mentors, was uh, one of the principal investigators uh, in those clinical trials that really uh, helped establish you know, how PSA and the early detection of prostate cancer might be best applied to men. We still um, work with that tradition today. You know, it's, a, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month now, and we do a number of things to try to make sure that men are, are aware of what they need to be uh, educated about in terms of the early detection of prostate cancer. We've learned over time that it's not something that we blindly apply PSA screening to all men, but we also need to make sure that men are fully educated about the importance of PSA screening in the early detection of prostate cancer, because there are high-risk groups that need to know how this can be helpful to them. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Maroney, for that information. So we are now going to open the discussion to both Dr. Maroney and Dr. McNeil as we transition into more of the details surrounding prostate cancer screenings and high-risk factors. So could one or both of you start us off in this discussion by briefly explaining what prostate cancer is and what are some of the symptoms to look for? So the prostate gland is a small walnut-shaped organ that's uh, between the bladder and the penis. I describe it as kind of like a donut. Uh, the urethra uh, goes, goes right through the, through the middle of it. And when men have cancer, they're basically small cells that have decided to not follow the rules. Uh, the a way that I think about cancer is, uh, you know, we have uh, this rule book that's our DNA and the cancer starts to sort of cross out some of the rules and uh, starts to not, not, to not follow those instructions that our body gives it. So it starts to push other cells out of the way. It starts to break free and spread around the body. So you might find that the cancer grows and starts to push on, say, the urethra or might spread to lymph nodes or or even the bone uh, where it doesn't belong. Some of the symptoms that might men get as a result of this are some more difficulty with urination. Occasionally, if it's spread to the bone, they might get some pain in those areas. How we detect this is primarily through blood tests in a way we're trying to find this early before it's caused some of these symptoms. 
And in the 1980s, we discovered that there's a blood test that, that may be able to, to help with this. Awesome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing. Thanks for the explanation. When you think of screening and screening for any disease, basically you're just trying to find out whether or not somebody has it before it causes a problem. Most guys with prostate cancer don't have symptoms. And if you do have prostate uh, cancer symptoms, it's typically because you have advanced disease. So all of the things that we look at in terms of screening and determining whether or not someone's at high risk, we're trying to find it before it causes a problem. And if we're able to intervene before it causes a problem, you have a chance of having a great outcome. So prostate cancer, like many other cancers, typically has certain risk factors that increase a person's risk of developing this type of cancer. Could you talk about these risk factors and what makes a person a high risk patient for prostate cancer? So I'm actually smiling. I know the audience, you can't see me, you can only hear me, but hopefully you can feel the joy in my voice because if one were to say, hey, what's a risk factor for prostate cancer? I know this is a podcast, but if you could just put a picture of me up on a screen, I would be a walking risk factor, all of me. So let's, <laughs> so let's think about it. Your age, I'm not in the high risk group yet, but for the most part, we look at for prostate cancer, men who are between the ages of 55 and 70. I'm a bit younger than that. I won't tell you how much younger I am, but my, because my father had prostate cancer, because my father died from prostate cancer at a younger age, because there are other men in my family who have prostate cancer, um, I am at higher risk. I'm also at higher risk because I'm African-American. And also I'm at higher risk because there are members of my family who have had breast cancer. You may think it's weird, like how does breast cancer relate to prostate cancer? Believe it or not, there are similar genes that act in both diseases. So those are some of the risk factors for prostate cancer. With, uh, as far as risk factors for prostate cancer, Dr. McNeil mentioned all of them. We're talking about age. Uh, if you're older, this is a risk factor for prostate cancer, genetic susceptibility. So if you had a uh, family history of especially metastatic prostate cancer that you develop at a young age, breast cancer is mentioned, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, any of those cancer, especially at younger ages. Men of African ancestry, we know for reasons that aren't entirely clear, but we're starting to put those links together about the, the genetic reasons why that might be. Uh, men of African ancestry are also at higher risk for developing prostate cancer. So, you know, some of those areas being explored uh, and investigated include uh, some genetic or epigenetic differences in androgens, androgen receptors. There might be some other growth factors that could be responsible for some of these differences that urologists need to be aware of. Thank you for that information. So in terms of early detection and prevention, what are prostate cancer screenings and how can they help? Prostate cancer screenings generally include a blood test called PSA or prostate specific antigen. The AUA does not recommend screening for asymptomatic men with average risk before the age of 55, men, but men at high risk should have a discussion with their physician about the utility of PSA screening starting at the age of 40. This includes men with a family history of the previously mentioned cancers and men of African ancestry. So I'm smiling again because I hit several of the risk factors. Dr. Maroney, are you ready to have me as your colleague, as your patient too? Yeah, Dr. McNeil, I'm interested in, in how you frame your thoughts around prostate cancer screening, given your history and experience. So, um, again, using the, the American Urologic Association guidelines sort of as a, as a roadmap, if you're between the ages of 55 and 70, you should get screened with a PSA test, the blood test for prostate cancer and maybe a digital rectal exam. And you should do this every couple of years at least. Uh, for some guys who are a bit, a bit higher risk, you should screen yearly. Uh, if you have a family history of prostate cancer, I think that you should start screening a bit earlier. Uh, for some men that's at age 50. Uh, for other men, I think that that's at age 45. 
However, we get into a bit of a hazy gray area when we're thinking about men who have several folks in their family with prostate cancer. For some of those men, I've actually started screening at age 40. It doesn't necessarily follow the usual recommendations, but if you come in to see me and, you know, four to five guys in your family have had prostate cancer and you're of African descent, I may check a PSA level when you're 40. And depending on what it is, I may not check for a couple of years. So it, it all varies. The key thing I think that we should drive home is that prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening is not a one size fits all dilemma. Uh, you should talk to your doctor about it and go from there. If I might add, there's one thing I think that's important to distinguish, and that is there's diagnosing disease and screening. In screening, we're talking about asymptomatic men. So that's when these ages apply. When men have symptoms, that's a very different thing. I've seen men as young as 37 be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And, and these are generally, you know, in, th in this case, it was somebody that had prostatitis-like symptoms for several years and had many cores with prostate cancer present. So I think it's important for not just urologists, but also primary care providers to be understanding of this idea that, okay, yeah, screening is for asymptomatic men. But when we have people that have concerning symptoms, we need to be uh, thinking about checking PSA levels. Agreed. I'm totally with you on that, Dr. Maroney. Thank you both for that information. Now, I know that there are many different treatment options for prostate cancer. So what would you say for someone who is looking to learn about the best treatment for their situation? There are so many different uh, treatment options for prostate cancer. Uh, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole today and go into the details, but there's surgery, there's radiation, for others, actually, we just watch it. There's something called active surveillance where you may have a low risk prostate cancer and we may just follow you and check a blood test every few months or so. There are even some guys that we're doing cryotherapy on. We're actually freezing the prostate. We don't do it that often, but you know, it's a possibility. It's an option for some. And nowadays, we're looking at ways to treat prostate cancer by just focusing on the cancer cells and sparing the rest of the prostate. So there are various targeted things. Uh, one thing, uh, which isn't widespread yet, but it may be in the future, is high-intensity focused ultrasound. Uh, in some centers, they're using that to destroy prostate cancer cells. So lots of options for you. Where there is a will, there is a way. And your urologist will help tailor your care for you. Yes, I think it's, it's certainly a really complicated discussion that's, that's pretty hard to fully cover in this podcast. But there's two things that, that I would say to men. One is take a deep breath and you have time to make a good decision about this. There's no reason to jump hastily into any sort of treatment right away. The other is to get multiple opinions from multiple different subspecialties. I, I, I strongly believe in a multidisciplinary approach to prostate cancer, to making sure that men are fully educated about all the options that they have for treatment. And so with all of this information and all of the information that's out there about prostate cancer, there are still communities that do not have access to the resources needed to care for patients with prostate cancer, especially those who may be at high risk. Can you talk a little bit about those disparities in the medical field and why they occur? Okay. As far as uh, disparities in the medical field, we've discovered, and this is not a, a new problem. This is something I think we've not really understood for decades that there are uh, disparities in outcomes uh, in men based on race, and also based on socio, socioeconomic status. So as far as the differences based on race, we're not entirely clear why these happen. There seem to be possibly genetic reasons why men of African ancestry have worse outcomes with prostate cancer. As far as, uh, as, far as the socioeconomic differences, not only uh, men of African ancestry, but also other indigenous peoples, uh, Latinx or Hispanic uh, ethnicities, uh, or non-English speaking patients seem to have worse outcomes. And uh, we need to really tackle this 
as a urologic community to try to make sure that all of our patients are getting equal care and the care that they deserve. I agree with you, Dr. Moroni. Uh, you know, again, there are some topics surrounding prostate cancer, which are incredibly personal to me. And just from the disparity uh, perspective, I often think of healthcare disparities and how they affect uh, families. You know, again, I think that in some ways, when we become adults, we're all living out the, the things of our childhood, whether they were good things or tra trauma. And for me, losing my father when I was 15, it was, a, uh, it was traumatic. He didn't see me graduate from high school. You know, there were basketball games and track meets that he missed because of it. Not that, that I was that good in basketball. I mean, I'm a urologist, by the way. And although you can't see me out there, I'm not that tall. <laughs> but these things are traumatic and they put a stamp on us. And I got to admit, losing my father at that age was traumatic for me. And I often wonder if men um, who grew up in similar circumstances that I did, if the adult men had greater access to care, would they would men like my father, uh, would they have been diagnosed at an earlier stage before the disease became metastatic and before that, before they could, before they died from it. So disparities exist. And I know that sometimes when we think about the statistics and the studies, we'll say, oh, there's no need to screen folks that are young because if you screen folks, it'll cost this much to screen and you're only saving one or two lives. But hey, what does that life mean to that person's loved ones? You never know. You can't put a price on that. So disparities exist. And, you know, I'm glad that we're in this fight together, along with other members of the American Urological Association, to address these disparities and to ensure that all men at risk of prostate cancer at least have a fair shot. Thank you both for that information. So obviously these disparities do have an impact on clinical practices. So what does that impact look like? And what can a urology practice do to help reduce these disparities? Yeah, I would say uh, one thing that we can do is to realize that everyone is not the same. There are cultural differences, there are genetic differences. And I think that urology practices, uh, we need to remain uh, somewhat flexible and sort of meet our communities where they are, whether that's outreach, whether that's taking a little more time to explain screening and what it is and how beneficial it is to someone who may not get it initially. I think that we need to remain uh, somewhat flexible and aim to address our communities uh, where they are. Yeah, the biggest impact on clinical practices, I think, is the effect of delayed care. So this usually means that instead of dealing with an easy problem, we have a, a problem that's many times more difficult to take care of. So we'll see kidney stones that are larger. We'll see prostate or testis cancers that have become metastatic that we might have been able to intervene on earlier. This, this is going to require a higher intensity of care that's going to distract from, from other needs in our practice, or it may have created a problem that can only be managed at a tertiary facility that may be really far from where these patients live, which really compounds the problem. As far as how do we reduce these disparities, I'm going to talk about this pretty broadly. We, we know these healthcare disparities exist beyond prostate cancer and men of African ancestry. It's our, our Hispanic and Latinx patients, indigenous peoples, Asian and other non-English speaking communities have worse health outcomes by most metrics. But there are many things that can be done. We can try to have educational materials that are written at a fifth grade level and multiple languages available in the clinic. And I really appreciate the fact that the Urology Care Foundation is starting to build some of these materials to help smooth out some of these language barriers. Uh, it's important to have interpreter surfaces available. And, and with technology now, we can have, at least in my clinic, we have these rolling iPad-like kiosks that we can have any language available within moments. Uh, this has made the conversation with a non-English speaking patient considerably easier. I think it's important to hire a staff that reflects your community and market this uh, so that you can uh, have a staff that's going to meet the needs and make your, uh, your community members feel more comfortable when they come into your clinic. Have discount prescription cards available for your patients. Track your outcomes and compare these based on race or ethnicity. 
consider sponsoring a health fair and par or partnering with a local group as a service event for your practice. So here this month, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and we're partnering with the Center for African American Health and inner city uh, clinic to have a prostate screening event to really shine a light on this. Uh, be an advocate. Thankfully, social determinants of health is now an element in the 2021 ENM billing rules. And I think that's important, but I also think the use of interpreter services should be an additional element. We need to try to work towards that as a, a group. Finally, and most importantly, be aware of these disparities. We are used to diagnosing disease and looking out for high-risk patients. When we have an underserved community member, this should really alert us that uh, these patients generally have poor outcomes and we need to identify these patients as high-risk patients. And we need to work hard to make sure that the medical, they get the medical care and the education that they deserve. Thank you so much for that. So what advice do you both have for patients and caregivers regarding early detection of prostate cancer, especially within those communities that may not have access to as many resources? Have a conversation with your doc about it. You know, be open, speak about your family, your family history, and ask your doctor, should I have a PSA test done? Should I have a digital rectal exam done? Uh, there's this bit that we call shared decision-making that I think Dr. Maroney mentioned a little earlier. And, uh, you know, it's a shared decision. Claim ownership of it. Have the conversation, and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Dr. McNeil. For patients that have a primary care provider, I, I, that, I think they should absolutely have that conversation if they if they know they're a high-risk group or at least engage with their primary care provider to talk about some of the risk factors that they might have, if they don't have a primary care provider, try to participate in a local screening event. Many churches, mosques, synagogues, community centers, and clinics are going to have these from time to time. So this may be an opportunity where you can get a PSA test. And then if you get alerted that you have an abnormal level, then try to reach out to whatever hospitals or clinics that might be around you to see if they can help you determine whether you need to take that a step further. Find a practice that fits your needs and, and budget. Some community practices have flexible payment plans. Uh, you can visit with a case manager at your community hospital. Sometimes patients are surprised that they might actually qualify for a health plan. I have patients that uh, that, uh, that I'll see from time to time, and they're, they're pleasantly uh, surprised that they are able to, to get health insurance when they didn't think they were otherwise able to. The rules seem to be changing all the time for who qualifies for, for some of these health plans. Do either of you have anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today on this topic? Uh, at the time of this recording, we remain in the midst of the uh, coronavirus <laughs> pandemic. Um, it's sort of waxed and waned. And I'd like to highlight that communities that were at risk before, they're at even greater risk now. The coronavirus pandemic has limited access to care for several men at risk of prostate cancer. And it's also delayed therapy for several men who should have had radiation or surgery um, to address their prostate cancer. So. There's a lot of work to do in the uh, healthcare disparity space, especially as it relates to prostate cancer. And we should all keep that in mind. I think Dr. McNeil's comments are, are so salient that this pandemic has amplified the healthcare disparities. We are looking through an article yesterday at uh, Medicare beneficiaries. Caucasian Americans had had about a 13% worse mortality through the pandemic, but in Asian, African ancestry populations, uh, indigenous peoples, those differences in healthcare mortalities for those populations were more in the 20 to 35% range. So it was substantially higher during the pandemic. We need to really take this opportunity to focus on how we, you know, how we, uh, the, the procedures that we have in our practices, noticing that our patient, you know, we want to strive for equal outcomes for all of our patients. Uh, that's just part of being good doctoring. I really appreciate that the fact that the Urology Care Foundation is spending a lot of time trying to build new materials and shining a spotlight on healthcare disparities as 
something that we all need to work on in improving the care that we give for our patients. Dr. McNeil and Dr. Maroney, thank you both for taking the time for this important discussion. We appreciate all that you shared with us today. This podcast is part of an educational series supported by independent educational grants from Astellis, Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, Janssen Biotech, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, Merck, and Pfizer. This podcast has also been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Urological Association. For more information on today's topic and for all things urology health, visit urologyhealth.org. That's urologyhealth.org.